This week, 493 years ago, the Marburg Colloquy took place. It was in a place called Marburg, which is in Germany. A, a colloquy is a, a sort of um, debate or discussion, conference, if you will, where people got together. And this was an important meeting, a discussion that lasted several days where someone you may know named Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli tried to come to an agreement on doctrine, on their doctrinal distinctives. Now, Luther was from Germany. Later, the Lutheran movement would come out of that. Uh, Zwingli was from Switzerland. Later, the, the Reformed churches would come from there. And they especially met to try to come to an agreement about the Lord's Supper, which is interesting because we, we do have the Lord's Supper and we have the elements right before us. So this, this might be an object lesson or sort of a visual aid, literally, for you to understand this debate. They discussed 15 points of doctrine. And Luther and Zwingli agreed on the first 14, almost there, all the most important points of Christian doctrine, Protestant doctrine, much of which we would embrace today, but they could not agree on that last point concerning the Lord's Supper. And the issue had to do with the presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Zwingli ministered in Switzerland, and later John Calvin would improve upon his view that these, the bread and the wine, were indeed, indeed symbols. But John Calvin would improve upon that and come to the, I believe, biblical position, teaching that, that Christ was spiritually present to the receivers of the Lord's Supper, who by faith partake in the elements, they are partakers of Christ, and commune with Him spiritually and truly. The Reformed view. Luther, he would say, and he said, and the Lutherans even until today would say, that Christ was, was locally present. He, he was in, with, and under the bread and the wine, and that would mark German Lutheranism. It marks Lutheranism for ages to come until today, that Christ is in some sense locally present. It's an interesting debate. A lot of people these days don't think about the Lord's Supper this deeply. Certainly, they wouldn't feel that they needed to have a big conference to discuss the doctrine. It can be sad to see Christians disagree on these important things. But thankfully, these kinds of debates, this debate continues to be one within the family of God. We can disagree on things like the Lord's Supper, on church government, baptism, and so on, which we really feel are very important because the Scriptures teach on these things. But one thing we simply cannot disagree on is Christ Himself. Luther and Zwingli might have different views, have had different views on Christ's presence, but they agreed on who Christ was. We must agree on who Christ is. Because as Jesus says, unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Now if you read much of Luther, maybe in the heat of the moment as he debated Zwingli, I, I wouldn't think it's too far-fetched that it crosses his mind to think, unless you believe that Christ is in, with, and under the bread and the wine, Zwingli, you will die in your sins. Um, don't do that, all right? But he was a fiery character. Christ his person, his work. This is the most important thing for Christians in terms of what makes a Christian. Of course, all sorts of things are attached to it. But as we come to John chapter 8, and we've read from verses 21 to 30, we see those bold words of Jesus Christ, unless you believe that he is who he says he is. He is who the Father says he is. You will die in your sins. And last week in verses 13 down to 20, well really verse 12 down to 20, we saw that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will walk in darkness, but will have, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And he testifies of himself. He is the self-attesting light, much like the scriptures, much like the word of God. You have many good reasons to believe in the word of God. 
all kinds of good reasons on earth, but at the end of the day, the scriptures are to be received because they are the word of God. Christ is to be received not simply because of archaeological evidence or great philosophical um, um, arguments for him or for God or for the Christian faith. Those are all great. But Christ is to be received because he is the Son of God. Because he is. And he has revealed himself to us. And he is worthy of full trust and reception. The Father himself is a witness to this. The Pharisee said, who, who is your witness? They wanted to condemn him. And he says, first of all, I'm the witness, you know, the Son of God. <laughs> Second of all, my Father in heaven, he's a great witness too, isn't he? He even spoke from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I've got a pretty good case. I've got some pretty good witnesses. Jewish law says you need two to three witnesses. Two to three human witnesses. I give you two divine persons that testify that I am who I say I am. But then we see the unbeliever's unwillingness. What are you talking about? Who is your... Show us your witness then. Oh, you claim the Father is your witness. Show him to us. Why don't you bring him to the stand? So they would not accept Jesus' testimony, nor the Father's testimony, nor John the Baptist's testimony, nor the people whom he's healed's testimony, nor the thousands of people that witness him multiply the bread and the fish's testimony. None at all. And we learn that there is only one cure for a person's unwillingness to receive the Word of God. Do you still remember what that cure is? The only cure for one's unwillingness to receive the Word of God is the, the Word of God. The very thing which we reject, which we do not believe in, which we won't accept, is the very thing when blessed by the Holy Spirit brings us out of darkness and into light, brings us from not believing in Christ to believing in Christ, from hating the Scriptures to loving the Scriptures. And exactly what is it that Jesus has been saying? What has he been teaching that the Pharisees are unwilling to accept? Well, I want us to just do a quick comparison of the two statements Jesus has made at the end of the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, where, where he uses the water pouring ceremony and the light festival to point to himself as the provider of living water? to point to himself as the light of the world. Look at this. Go back to chapter 7, verse 37. He says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. A bold statement. Now, I need to, you, it's better if you have a paper Bible because it's easier for you to flip. Go back to chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. Two bold statements about himself. Drink of me, I am, the, I am the light of the world. Great statements. Now go back to 738. Whoever believes in me. Back to chapter 8, verse 12. Whoever follows me. You see that? So first a statement of who he is, and then a statement of, if you believe in me, if you follow me, chapter 738, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And in chapter 8, verse 12, he will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see this preaching formula of Jesus Christ? I provide living water. I am the light of the world. If you believe in me, if you follow me, you will live and have rivers of living water. You will no longer walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. Because of who Jesus is, those who trust in him, those who believe in him, those who follow him, go from being parched and thirsty and destitute to filled and satisfied. Go from being in darkness and sin and despair and deception and lies to having life and communion with God to entering into the kingdom of the Son, the kingdom of light where truth prevails. Now, Jesus would go on to say 
that he and his Father in heaven are trustworthy witnesses to his Messiahship. And you know that God's testimony trumps all of human opinion. And this is where we concluded last week in verse 19, chapter 8, verse 19. Sorry, verse 20. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Right? And this is after challenging him. Go ahead. Show me. Where is your father? Where is your witness? Go ahead. Put your witness on the stand. Further confirming the unbelievers' hardened hearts and unwillingness to receive the truth. And then here's what happened next. happens next. Remember they're trying to kill him? And what often happens when we are speaking the truth and the people that we are speaking to get upset, get angry at the truth which we are saying, and maybe they play the victim and it's because you're arrogant, because you're rude, because you're all of these things. Oftentimes, we, we clam up, we, we fold, we retreat. We say, you know what, maybe I don't need to speak about the truth. Maybe it's not worth it to talk about the truth. Well, this is what Jesus does next. He then preaches a classic fire and brimstone sermon. So that's not all of Jesus' preaching. It's not all fire and brimstone. It also depends who he's talking to. But if you have a problem with classic fire and brimstone preaching, well, you might have a problem with, Jesus, with what Jesus is about to do right here. His main sermon point, if you were to flash it on the screen, is unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And this sermon is being preached at the temple complex. He's preaching in the treasury. He's speaking at the belly of the beast, if you will, at the very heart of what has now gone as the religion of the Jews had denigrated into man-made traditions and externalism and legalism, so much so that they rejected their own Messiah. So here what, here's what we see at first point. We see the result, the result of unbelief. What happens when you continue in your unbelief, verse 21, so he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. He's told them this already before, right? I'm going somewhere that you cannot come. And they were kind of confused. Is he going to go out of the wilderness? Is he going to go out to the Gentiles and preach there? What does he mean? Where is Christ going? Well, guys, first of all, he's going to glory. His hour of glory, as, G, as John calls it, will arrive as he is lifted up on the cross. He will be slain for sinners. And that actually, in the Gospel of John, is his hour of glory. It's that glorious moment that he has been born for. It's that time where he reconciles holy God and wretched sinners through his death on the cross. And then he will descend to the grave. On the third day, he will rise. And finally... He will ascend back to heaven where he came from to sit at the Father's right hand. That's where Jesus is going. He is, he belongs to heaven, and he's saying, You guys, if you do not believe in me, know that you cannot come. So the Jews said in verse 22, Will he kill himself? Since he says, Where I am going, you cannot come. Now, these are very smart people, okay? They're not stupid, but they are in darkness. They are blinded by unbelief. They cannot discern the truths which Jesus speaks of. Remember 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And here's a perfect example of people who knew their Bibles well, were very religious, all kinds of religiousness, but they could not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They could not spiritually discern. They showed, they proved that they did not have the Spirit of God, that they did not have spiritual eyes to see the truth. I mean, the truth was standing right in front of them and they could not see him. Suicide, they wonder. Is he going to kill himself? Well, this is, I mean, you could read all about what the Jews thought about suicide. It's an interesting thing, but they're thinking, is he going to commit suicide? Well, far from it. 
he will willingly lay down his life for sinners. He's not going to kill himself. That's not what the gospel is. All right? If you're not, if you're not robust in your doctrine of the Trinity, okay? The one being of God, the distinction of persons in the one God, and so on, then it might feel like Jesus is committing suicide because you say that he is God. But no, that's not what is happening. He is going to lay down his life. He will bear the wrath of God. He will be crushed under the Father's judgment for sinners so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now, he doesn't explain any further about these things. He has seen enough. He has heard enough of the unbelief. So in verse 23, he simply says to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. That's why he told Nicodemus back in chapter 3, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Remember, the world is in darkness. The world is held captive to the lies of the evil one. The world loves its sin. It is corrupting us. It is decaying us. And we go deeper and deeper into darkness. And remember, the darkness doesn't want the light. But Jesus is not of this world. He is from above. People in the world, people from below, they don't know what that is. They don't know what it's like to be heavenly. Christ is the light from above, and here we are down below loving our darkness. And in all of this, I think Jesus is saying much more than, you can't go to heaven with me. He's saying, hey, Pharisees, people listening to my preaching right now, I'm not going to be here forever, you know. I'm actually about to move on and do other things. You won't hear me preaching this truth for long. He's actually pressing them. He wants them to come to terms with this confronting truth. He told them in verse 21 that they will die in their sin. Why? Verse 24. I told you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Th this is the whole point of this little sermon. This is why He is saying these things. This is why He's willing to confront them. There's that I am again. That I am He. I am who I am He. The one sent by the Father. The one who does the Father's will. The Messiah. The Word become flesh. God become man. I am He. As uh, John Calvin puts it, Jesus is calling people to believe all that the Scriptures ascribes to the Messiah and all that it tells us to expect of Him. He is actually, in one sense, pleading with the Jewish people. He is telling them the Scriptures. He is expositing the Old Testament Scriptures to them. He is displaying it to them. He is giving them every opportunity and every reason to see He really is the announced Messiah. It's kind of like when God says in Isaiah 43.10, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Just in light of the Old Testament, that's why it's ridiculous to take Jesus' I am statements to be anything other than at times explicit and at times implicit claims to deity. That he is the Lord. There is no other. Similarly, Jesus is saying, unless you believe that salvation from sin and death comes through me alone, you will remain in darkness and you will die in your sins. Much like Ezekiel, who was made a watchman over Israel, Jesus comes as the true prophet willing to preach hard truths. The job of a prophet is a difficult one. You know about many prophets in the Old Testament that didn't even want to be prophets. You think about Jonas, I don't even want to do this. I'm going to run away. You think about Jeremiah who's just weeping. All these bad things are happening to them. I mean, some really horrible things happen to the prophets because of the people's unbelief. It's the same thing that Jesus is enduring. All the ridicule and they want to kill him. They want to throw him in jail. And ultimately, they would get what they want. They would put him to death. Much like the martyrs that have gone before and after. 
I mean, look what God said to Ezekiel. We, we read from Ezekiel earlier. If you could turn back to Ezekiel chapter 33, I think this would be helpful. Ezekiel 33, here's what God says in verses 7 to 9, right? So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning for me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked, die, you shall, wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his wrath, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. Do you see this? Do you see what's going on here? You better preach, Ezekiel. I, have, I am God. I have called you. I have commissioned you. I have given you a word from heaven. You better say it or else the people's blood are on your hands. But it's not all just judgment. Look at verses 14 to 16. Again, though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. Yet if he turns from his sin and does what is just and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has taken by robbery, and walks in the statutes of life, not doing injustice, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the sins that he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is just and right. He shall surely live. That sounds good. Is it possible? Is it, is it possible for you to right all of your wrongs? To correct all of your ways? To, to turn a new leaf, if you will? It's almost like asking, hey, earlier in the service, Psalm chapter 1, I want to be the blessed man. I want to be that blessed man who, who does not walk with these people, who does not sit with the sinners and, and take part in their evil schemes. But once you look at the wretchedness and wickedness of your own heart, you see that you are unable to be like this blessed man. You are unable to make things right. And that's exactly why Christ came. Truly, apart from his saving work, we will remain in our sins. We will die in our sins. So much like Ezekiel, Jesus is commissioned by the Father in heaven to preach these things. And he will do nothing apart from what the Father wills. For he and the Father are one. And he says, I only come to do what the Father has sent me to do. I am always doing what is pleasing to the Father. And what is pleasing to the Father in this moment as Jesus in the temple, is in the temple preaching to the Jews, it is pleasing to the Father that he would tell them that unless they believe in him, they will die in their sins. I want to get back to the meaning of dying in your sins later. But now I want us to see, secondly, the reason for Jesus' preaching. The result of unbelief, if you continue in that way, is that you will die in your sins. But why is Jesus preaching so boldly here? Why is he taking the time to do this? Why did Ezekiel preach when people often hated what he said? Because he received a word from God. Why is Jesus preaching even to a people that want to kill him? Let's find out. Verse 25, they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. You see how some of those people who were starting to consider several passages ago, this really is the prophet. They were really on to something. Much like the prophets of old, Jesus Christ has received a word from heaven. Oh, wait a minute. He is the word from heaven. And he cannot help but speak the truth. Christ has been sent, commissioned for a rescue mission, and a necessary part of that mission is to tell sinners a word from God. God is an amazing God who communicates to us by way of language, and he reveals himself to us through the spoken word. They ask him, who are you? Why do they ask him that? Because he said, unless you believe that I am he. They thought it was ridiculous for him to say that they needed to believe in him. 
to trust in Him for dear life. So they ask, who are you? And the ESV and most translations, all the way back to the KJV, um, translates Jesus' response in verse 25 as something like, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. You look at it, look at your Bibles. It's all saying something like that. What I've been telling you all along, what I've been telling you from the beginning, just what I've been saying, and so on. But another way of translating this could be, it could be, if you actually look at the language, why in the world am I still speaking to you? Now, I'm not going to die on that hill. I'm not going to fight for that translation, all right? Bible translators are much smarter than me. But that is a legitimate way of translating the Greek text. Why am I still speaking to you? Why in the world am I speaking to you? In any case, he goes on to say that he could say much more about them. Uh, I have much to say about you. I have much to judge. But this is not why I have come for his first coming. Remember, the Son of Man was sent to this world not to judge, but to save. It's not saying he's not going to judge the living and the dead. That time will come. But in this time, as Jesus comes as the lamb who would be slain for sinners, he has a very specific mission, and it's to go to the cross. No matter what they say, they're poking fun at him, they're mocking him, they're criticizing him, they're questioning his testimony. God is the ultimate authority. He is the one that sent Christ. Christ says what the Father in heaven says. What the Father in heaven says is true, and the people's unbelief cannot change that. There are many people throughout church history that have shown similar unwavering convictions. You think about a man named Athanasius who lived in the time of the 300s AD, in the time of Emperor Constantine, during the days of the Council of Nicaea when they were fighting against Arius and Arianism who denied the biblical doctrine of the Trinity and spoke of Jesus as some kind of lesser substance than God, similar but lesser still than God himself. And Athanasius was actually there in the days of Nicaea. Um, and the Nicene Creed, if you've ever read it, I'm sure you'd agree, is a, it's a pretty awesome statement on the Trinity. Very, very clear. But did you know that not so long after, Constantine actually reinstated Arius. And when he reinstated Arius, this man, Athanasius, who I believe was a deacon in the church, he kept on going on, fighting against Arianism. He would not submit to this horrible reinstating of Arius and his followers. He wanted to continue to, to show their errors because he truly believed that if you get the doctrine of God wrong, you get everything wrong. If you get Jesus wrong, you get everything wrong. And he was constantly exiled and thrown in captivity because of this. And he's just like, what happened to the Council of Nicaea? What happened to the stuff that we wrote? Why is Arius being restated, reinstated? And there was a saying that went about for the rest of his life, Athanasius contra mundum. It was as if it was Athanasius against the world. His convictions were unwavering about the doctrine of the Trinity, even when it seemed like everyone else thought, Arius is going to be all right. It's not so bad. Such unwavering and unflinching conviction the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of God is worthy of. Think about it. Years later, there would be a creed that would take Athanasius' name, the Athanasian Creed. It followed not only his biblical teachings, but it also followed his kind of strong and powerful and firm conviction about why we must believe the God of the Scriptures. And in the Athanasian Creed, um, segment 29, I'll read it to you. It says this, But it is necessary for eternal salvation that one also believe in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ faithfully. Now this is the true faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and man equally. He is God from the essence of the Father, 
begotten before time, and he is man from the essence of his mother, born in time, completely God, completely man, with a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father as regards divinity, less than the Father as regards humanity. Although he is God and man, yet Christ is not two, but one. He is one, however, not by his divinity being turned into flesh, but by God's taking humanity to himself. I could go on, it's beautiful. It, it, it wonderfully expresses the biblical doctrine of the incarnation, of the union of the two natures of Christ as divine and as man in one person. People died. And here we often think about the creeds, we often think about getting, drilling down the details of the doctrine of the Trinity, and we think, yeah, you know, it's all, it's all good, it's all right. Like, this guy... You know, I remember once upon a time a very famous prosperity gospel preacher was surrounded by a bunch of um, evangelicals in this, in this conference, uh, and he was known to be a modalist, somebody who believes that th there's one God who is technically one person who takes the form of the Father and then the form of the Son and then becomes the form of the Spirit, and these evangelicals were basically just asking him question and answer, just answer yes or no. Do you believe that God is this? Do you believe that? And they were basically just forcing him into the mold of being Trinitarian. And they go, up oh, there he goes. T.D. Jakes is Trinitarian now. There, that was his name, T.D. Jakes, right? It was just, wait, well, hold on. Wait a minute. People died for this stuff. People died to get Jesus right, to make sure that the, <clears throat> the person of Christ that was being preached was the biblical person. Because unless you believe that he is that one, you will die in your sins. So when he tells the Pharisees this, he's telling them nothing new. He's telling them none other than the Word of God. And that's why Athanasius did what he did. He believed he was telling the people nothing other than the Word of God. That's why, that's why people died for certain things throughout church history, died for the gospel, because they truly believed that they were saying nothing other than the Word of God. Martin Luther when he stood before that emperor and said, here I stand, I can do no other, although it's debated whether or not he actually said that, it still sounds like a great story, and he could definitely do no other because he believed that everything he wrote in those books that they wanted him to recant and repent of were contained nothing but the word of God. He's doing, Jesus is doing what is actually the most loving thing anyone could ever do. Now this is difficult. But Athanasius, not letting go of this Arius issue, even after he was reinstated to the church, and he continued correcting and rebuking him, he would have been seen as a very annoying deacon in the church, right? But I tell you this, Athanasius was doing the most loving thing he could ever do to Arius at this point in time. He's warning them. Jesus is warning them of the impending judgment and destruction that awaits them if they continue rejecting God's word. And he is saying to them, unless, unless you believe, you, that is a beautiful word, I tell you, unless you believe, by implication, if you do believe, you can have life. You will live. The reason for Jesus' preaching may not sound like this because we're not so used to it. The reason for Jesus' preaching is the Father's love for sinners. The reason for Jesus' preaching is the Father's eternal decree to lovingly save sinners. This is the eternal love of the Father for the Son, which poured out into all of creation. The Father made all things out of His eternal love for His Son. The Father wants to redeem a people for Himself for the sake of His Son. He wants to take a people to become a bride for His Son. This is love. The love which brought Jesus to earth is now being announced through His very mouth. But sadly... In verse 27, they did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. That brings us to that 1 Corinthians 2 thing again. They, they couldn't discern these spiritual things. They could not accept that Jesus was who he said he was. They could not see that he was saying only what the Father was saying. They could not discern the great love that was right in front of them, that God would come down to us 
and become one of us to tell us the way of salvation? No, 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 no. To be the way of salvation? They ask, who are you? But seriously, seriously? They're asking Jesus, who are you? He should be asking you, who are you? No, seriously, who are you? Who are we? How dare we question the Son of God? Ignorance? And they were not ignorant of the words of Scripture, of what the prophets had said. But even though, even then, ignorance? Even that is not an excuse for our sinful rejection of God's revelation. Now here's something I want to point out then in all of this. To speak the truth in love is one of the greatest acts of compassion we could ever engage in. Even amongst Christians, that's what Paul tells us in Ephesians 4. Speak the truth in love. It is a picture of the kind of love that should be flourishing in the church. The two are not pitted against each other, being loving and being truthful. The two should be coming together. We speak the truth in love. We often talk about how blunt Jesus was with the Pharisees calling them whitewashed tombs and all that. How he rebuked their hypocrisy head on. And, you know, if you're into that stuff, you know, you really like Paul Washer and everything like that, you're like, yeah, yeah, this is great, you know, I love how Jesus treated the Pharisees and so on. But I hope you realize that he did this out of genuine love. N not a desire to just smash them. Not a desire to just show them how wrong they were. I mean, that's a part of it. He does need to show them how wrong they are. Do we not realize he did this out of genuine love? He did. He cared enough to tell them that if they, if they didn't repent and believe in him, they'd go to hell. This should challenge us. Even in the church, in cases where we confront people of their sin, even in the body of Christ, do we do it out of genuine love for them or is it out of mere arrogance? Is it simply because this person is acting in a way, behaving in such a way that I don't approve of, and I just want them to stop? So I'm going to use this concept that as a church, we should be lovingly rebuking each other to tell them, what you're doing is bad, you better stop it, or else we're going to go to step two of church discipline, two or three witnesses, hey, like that. Or do we do this out of genuine love. When someone who doesn't know Christ just isn't getting the gospel and they're scoffing at you and they make fun of you, do we get frustrated? As if our frustration would change anything about that person's heart? Just look at Christ. He definitely spoke the truth in love. And even when he was filled with righteous indignation against the hypocrisy and blindness of unbelievers, he never sinned in his anger. Never. Or are we forgetting that we are those hypocrites? That we are the blind ones? And it was only the sovereign grace of God which made us new creations, without which we'd be just like these guys. We would meet Jesus in the flesh, and we would dare ask, who are you? That's us. Not understanding what Jesus is saying. So we speak the truth in love, and we, like Christ, should leave up to, to God, obviously. Here's the third and last point, the response of the hearers. If we care enough about people to tell them the truth, the beautiful truth, but also the very hard and difficult and heavy truths, we mere mortals should leave up the response of the hearers to God. Look at verse 28. So Jesus said to them, when you, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. Jesus knew that his time of vindication would come. Christians should also know that their time of vindication will come. Jesus did not stand there and start getting sinfully angry and frustrated at these people's unbelief. In fact, he was filled with compassion. In fact, he even recognized there will come a time where these people will realize they're wrong. And it will be the time 
when you have lifted me up, when you will crucify me. Do you see what he's saying here? The increasing intensity of the tension between Jesus and the Pharisees is precisely what, in God's providence, will lead to his crucifixion. Them getting more and more and more and more and more mad at him by their own sinful volition is actually part of God's sovereign plan which will make him end up going to the cross. They, they, they're going to get mad enough that they're actually going to finally do it. And when Jesus is lifted up on that cross, people will know. People may not trust in him for themselves, but they will see, especially as he rises from the grave, uh, what he said was true. When the Jews put him to death, people will know. Does this mean that people will immediately be saved? That these Jews will see what happens at the cross and they'll believe in him truly and be saved? They will finally become Christians? Not necessarily. Some will. Some will go deeper into their unbelief. And we said this last week, gospel preaching is like a double-edged sword where God's elect will lead to their regeneration, to their repentance and faith, to their new and everlasting life. It will feed their souls for eternity. But for those who willingly choose the path of destruction and remain in their unbelief and willfully resist and reject the Son of God, gospel preaching gives them more light and they shall be judged in accordance with the more light that they receive. It's a fearful thing to consider if you ever preach the gospel, that it may lead to eternal life, but it may also lead to a confirmation of judgment against those who reject the Christ whom you preach. Remember the centurion and the people who were with him in Matthew 27, verse 4, when Jesus was crucified, and then later on, when there was an earthquake? They saw the earthquake and what took place. They were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Now somebody could say that, but still remain unchanged in their hearts. They could be convinced externally, Wait a minute, maybe he really is who he says he is. But do you personally trust in him as your Savior? Nicodemus, after Christ's death, he would end up joining Joseph of Arimathea to give Jesus a proper Jewish burial, clearly indicating the great esteem that he now has for this Jesus, who he once thought was simply a good teacher from God. Yet the vast majority of Jews would remain in their unbelief. Like Paul writes in Romans 11, a partial hardening has come upon Israel. After Jesus died on the cross, many realized Lots of things. They realized he was not a mere mortal, that he really was sent from heaven. They wouldn't be able to deny eyewitness testimonies of those who saw him risen from the dead. But what is the folly of unbelief? Knowing these facts of reality, many of the leaders would start making up stories about how Jesus' body was taken by his disciples. The folly of unbelief. They would continue to reject him because, remember, the sinner's problem is not lack of evidence. The sinner's problem is a heart problem. It's a moral problem. Hatred for God and love for sin. And in verse 29, last two verses, Jesus says, And he who sent me is with me. The Father is with him. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that, they are, that are pleasing to him. He's, he's showing them this intimacy between Father and Son, the oneness of Father and Son, and he's trying to help them recognize that, you know, what you're saying to me, all the stuff that you're rejecting, all the stuff that you don't like, it's only reflecting your hatred for the Father. He's with me right now. He's never left my side. We are, we are one. We are a perfect union. Again, Christ proclaims that he's only doing what the Father sent him to do. He is God's beloved Son. He is the Savior sent from heaven. And unless you believe that's who he is, you will die in your sins. And in verse 30, it says that as many, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. Now, some commentators would say that these people were truly believers and they were saved right here. 
Certainly some of them may have, but it seems questionable. Because if you keep following, and we'll get to this next week, he turns to the people who, who believed, and he starts confronting them, and they start appealing to Abraham as their father, and Jesus starts correcting them, and then the same group of people, Jesus then says, actually, the devil is your father. So just me personally, I find it hard to believe that this verse means that all of them became believers right there. Many who profess to believe in Christ, as we'll even see next week, will still die in their sins because their profession of faith is not a genuine possession of faith. So as we wrap up, I want to ask you, what does it really mean to die in your sins? It's very clear in our sermon today, in Jesus' teaching, I don't want that. <laughs> we don't want to be that guy. We don't want to die in our sins. Notice in verse 21, Jesus makes a general statement, you will die in your sin. You will die in this sinful state which you are in. You will die remaining in sin. Then in verse 24, he says, you will die in your sins. He uses the plural. Like your actual sins, which you have committed when you die in your sinful, unregenerate state, you do not enter the kingdom of heaven. You die in your sins, meaning every one of your sins will be dealt with by God and His wrath will be poured upon you as a just punishment for your rebellion against Him. The Pharisees Jesus spoke with did not need to wait until He was raised up on the cross. Do you know that? He was preaching the gospel to them right then and now unless you believe that I am He. And people today do not need to wait. They, they do not need to wait, and I hope you do not try to wait until the second coming of Christ. He tells you today that if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, this moment you will receive everlasting life, and your sins will have been dealt with at the cross. So Christians, oh dear true believers, people of God, how blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the one against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. How blessed? Eternally blessed by the eternal one sent from above who we will spend eternity with thanks to his love. Let's pray. O oh, Father in heaven, who are we that you would not withhold your own Son out of your great love to save sinners? Lord, we thank you that we as your people have entered into your new covenant of grace the moment you gave us eyes to see and ears to hear. We thank you that we could read passages like these and we pray would not be filled with pride but would instead be filled with compassion for those who do not yet know you. When we read passages like these and the hardness of people's unbelief, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to see ourselves there. You would help us to recognize that apart from grace, this is us. May that humble us. And may that lead us and help us to speak the truth in love as you have commanded, as Christ himself has displayed, and as we see all throughout the scriptures. Lord, you are the best example of this. Thank you for loving us enough to actually show us that we were headed for hell and that we needed to repent. Oh Lord, may that love abound in this covenant community and beyond. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.